Thank God it's Friday. I know we all feel that way. At least I do. I think this first week back from spring break, uh, it hits different. <laughs> it's, um, I'm definitely feeling a little tired at the end of this week. So looking forward to some rest this weekend. Um, and I think you all deserve some rest. And then we'll come back. We're going to finish up this eighth unit on Tuesday. We'll take our exam. Wednesday, those of you who are in the 10th grade will be here in person to take the PACT. Um, and then Thursday, we'll start our ninth unit. So we are chugging right along. Today, we'll talk about pathogens and natural selection. It's the fifth day of our eighth unit. Your objective today is to be able to explain how various disease agents, such as bacteria, viruses, and other chemicals can influence natural selection. The question today, what role do pathogens play in the concepts of natural selection and evolution? They certainly play an important role. Um, and we are going to explore that role a little bit today. We'll continue our conversation from today on Monday and uh, when we'll explore that a little bit more. But because they are some of the oldest life forms on Earth, uh, they certainly play a really important role, not just in their own natural selection, but in the natural selection and evolution of other life forms as well. All right. So what is a pathogen? A pathogen is any foreign substance that can cause a sickness or disease. Any foreign substance. And a foreign substance is just something that originated from outside of the organism's body. That's what we mean by foreign substance. So for example, even though um, poisonous frogs produce a specific toxin, it wouldn't be considered a pathogen to them because it is not a foreign substance. It's produced inside of their bodies. But of course, if you pick up that foreign frog or that, that, that poisonous frog, then of course, you're exposing yourself to a pathogen. Many pathogens, but not all, have what are called antigens on their external surfaces. And those ant antigens are what actually induce an immune response um, in the organism. But the good thing about the antigens is that they are unique in a way that allows our immune systems to recognize them uh, after we've survived a bout with, with the pathogen. So you get, you get a common cold, which is often caused by a virus. That virus has a unique antigen on its surface. Um, it might knock you out for a couple of days. You know, you might be stuffy. You might have some fatigue, maybe even a fever and a headache. But your body going forward will remember the antigen and you will avoid further sickness in the future. You already typed this day, Sean. I did finally remember to upload the YouTube videos from previous lessons. So if you want to go ahead and check those out, they are available to you. No? Are you good, Aristotle? Or do you need a little bit more time? Okay. Okay. Thanks, JT.
Okay, so what do you all think is the difference between genetic diseases and infectious diseases? I'm sure it's kind of obvious. Okay, which one is which? Good, so um, what Lance is saying for those who couldn't hear him, genetic diseases you get from your parents. In other words, genetic diseases are inheritable. Whereas infectious diseases, Lance points out, come from the environment. And that's, that's very, very true. So of course, we've talked about a few examples of genetic diseases, including cystic fibrosis, Down syndrome, sickle cell anemia. These are caused either by mutations within an individual's DNA or by some type of error in a process like meiosis. Um, and they can be passed on, especially if they happen within the germline, meaning within your sex cells. Infectious diseases, on the other hand, just like Lance pointed out, are coming from pathogens within a person's environment. Bacteria, viruses, parasites, we'll also talk about toxins today, um, and we'll give some examples of each of those. Both can be fatal, uh, both can be chronic, meaning that you, we don't have cures for certain genetic diseases, and we also don't have cures for infectious diseases. So in some cases, unfortunately, people will be dealing with them for their entire life. Um, and, but both in some cases we, we can treat or we can at least provide some mitigating responses to limit the severity of the disease. The first type of pathogen that we'll discuss is called a bacterium. The word bacteria is plural actually. So a sing singular bacteria is called a bacterium. It's that Latin background. Bacteria are omnipresent living, that's important, that's why I put it in italicis, unicellular prokaryotic microorganisms. That's a lot. What does the word omnipresent mean? Yeah, omnipresent means everywhere. We will literally find bacteria, if we were to literally take cotton swabs around the building and, and uh, swab every surface, we would find bacteria on every single cotton swab that we used. Even if we were to do it on each other, our hands are have bacteria, our clothes have bacteria. Bacteria are not inherently bad. They're not necessarily bad. Some of them certainly can be. They can be quite dangerous. But most bacteria are harmless. And some of, some of them, in some cases, provide a very direct benefit to other living organisms, including human beings. The bad ones that we have encountered and that cause you know, diseases, we have developed antibiotics for some of them. And uh, the antibiotics will kill off some portion of the bacteria. Unfortunately, as we'll find out later in the lesson, there are some bacteria that are now immune or resistant to our antibiotics, which presents a big problem. We'll talk more about that later. Bacteria are living. So what this means is that those Sternger processes that we discussed way back in January, bacteria need to be able to complete those eight essential life processes. Does anybody remember Sternger? I have a doubt of the first person who can tell me all eight letters of Sternger. This should be easy if you have your toes. Go ahead. Uh huh. Excellent. Thank you. So those eight essential life processes, bacteria have to be able to complete them because they are living. Um, we'll find out in contrast that viruses are not living. Uh, and that's the difference between them. Bacteria have to be able to reproduce. That's their primary goal, to survive and to reproduce. If you can remember that, then um, the study of bacteria and the study of pathogens in general is going to be a lot easier. Uh, we can see even on this slide, I know it's kind of small for you all, 
there are some examples of bacteria that we've probably, maybe you haven't heard about the bacteria themselves, but you've heard about the diseases that they cause. In the top right, um, we see Vibrio cholerae. That's the bacteria that causes cholera, which um, is a disease that is carried through water, specifically in places where their sewage is probably running into their drinking water, which is not a good thing, but it leads to extreme dehydration, uh, severe bouts of diarrhea, severe bouts of nausea. So all around bad. Is that what? Yeah, there, where do you see that one? Yeah, at the bottom. Um, what's botulism? What is that? Oh, what I was just talking about is cholera. Um, botulism is another, but you can see that there's that bacteria is present there at the bottom. Clostridium botulum, botulinum. <laughs> anyway, um, botulism is another, you know, pretty severe disease that can lead to severe birth defects if pregnant women get it. Um, it can also lead to limited neurological functioning. So that's a, that's not a good one. We can see streptococcus in the top left. That has anybody ever had strep throat? Yeah, not not pleasant, not pleasant. So that little bacteria in the top left that just looks like two circles, um, that's what's responsible for strep throat. Um, we can also see there's Legionnaires disease is one of the bacteria that's on the screen as well. So uh, what we're seeing are some some bad some bad some bad uh, characters, but not all of them are bad. In fact, there are more microorganisms, more bacteria inside of your body than there are your own cells, which is, which is pretty um, remarkable. By a conservative estimate, they outnumber your own cells by one, in a ratio of one to three, 1 1.3 to one, and that's conservative. You might even hear some numbers up to as high as uh, 12 to one. These are not bad things. Most of them kind of just go about their business. They don't disrupt your way of living at all, um, at least that we currently understand. Um, and some of them actually provide benefits to your immune system. They help you fight off other bacteria that are bad and they aid in digestion. So is anybody here a fan of kombucha? Anybody drink any kombucha? <laughs> kombucha is just like a probiotic drink. Um, there are other probiotic drinks. If you've seen Palm, oh, or she's got to make it on her desk right there. Um, Ashanti's drinking. Do you, what is that? What flavor is that? Mango. Does it, it might have some probiotic functions, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So these things aid. Um, they're not necessarily introducing new bacteria, but they are providing some nutrients to the bacteria that already exist in your digestive system. Uh, one cool thing for those of you who are interested in forensics, um, science has developed to the point where we can actually begin to identify people based on the microbiomes that are living inside of them. So if we can get a stool sample from someone, it can help us begin to identify them because we each have our own specific dietary preferences. We all have um, exposure to different bacteria in our day-to-day -day lives. And if we can get a stool sample, we can see that kind of footprint essentially, or fingerprint, that's actually a poop print, for lack of a better term. Um, and we can actually start to use it to identify people to say, hey, we see this bacteria, which we know only comes from this type of fish, which can only be purchased from these stores. Um, we know that we can also find this bacteria, which can only exist in a hot climate during the winter months. So this person must be coming from these places. And we can, you know, take all of those different, all of that different evidence and start to piece together where this person may have come from or who they are. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know. I guess just <laughs> in this study. That's a good question. All right, so kind of graphic here. So I apologize if any of you are squeamish. I um, should have provided some type of trigger warning, I guess. but. Um, we've got some bacterial infections here. Um, strep throat, we can see, you know, I used to deal with strep throat as a kid. I think I got it two or three times, not fun. Often leads to your tonsils needing to be removed. Um, staph infections come from open wounds that are exposed to unsanitary 
environments like locker rooms. So athletes are, are commonly infected with staph infections. Gonorrhea is a sexually transmitted infection. Um, fortunately, it can be treated, it can be cured. It is one of the more common sexually transmitted infections. Syphilis also is an STI. Uh, it can be treated, it can be cured, but it, it's much more difficult and expensive to do so. Syphilis is relatively rare. Um, syphilis has a unique history here in the United States because of the uh, Tuskegee Project in which black men who already had syphilis uh, were told by the government that they were being treated for their disease. But in reality, the government was not treating them and they were just kind of watching to see how the disease progressed until so the men eventually died. Um, so this was obviously extremely controversial, very unethical, um, and it has often been cited as one of the reasons why the black community does not trust the medical community to this day. Um, you might have some differing opinions about that, but the Tuskegee Project, of course, was, was, was racist and was very, very unethical. And then in the top left, we can see necrotizing fasciitis, which is a specific um, disease caused by a bacteria in which tissues of the body die rapidly. In fact, people have been known to go to sleep perfectly normal, wake up with their limbs black and, and puffy because this, the tissue is dying. Um, this is also caused by an open wound. This is why it's not a good idea to go swimming in open water if you know you've got a cut of some sort, because that's typically how these bacteria are able to enter your body. Um, what did you say, Paris? Saline. Sure. So if we, if, you know, if you're swimming in salt water, it can provide some health benefits. But of course, the ocean is a place where massive amounts of life exists. Microorganisms, you know, thrive in the ocean, even in salty environments. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the salt water can, if, you know, if we're, if it's, what am I trying to say, artificially created saline that you might be injected with in the hospital, or that might be introduced intravenously, you know, through your veins, that's a good thing, but Salt water, if you're just like out in the ocean, is is really not very healthy because there are other things that live there, plenty of bacteria. Um, so that's how we end up with diseases like necrotizing fasciitis. Unfortunately, there's no cure for this, really. The only way to stop the progression of the infection is to remove the, the infected tissue. So unfortunately, that baby probably ended up, yeah, with the leg being amputated. <clears throat> of course, this is not a sex ed class, but because we are talking about sexually transmitted diseases and infections, I do just want to mention, of course, there's some stigma associated with STIs and STDs, but it's important that you all know that they are a thing. It's important that you are comfortable talking about them, and it's important that you are comfortable knowing your own status about um, your, your health. So if you are sexually active, um, that is your decision, that's your choice. But you should, of course, be honest and open with your partner or partners, and you should be honest and open with your medical provider as well, and say, you know, I have made this decision for my life, I'd like to know a little bit more about what my options are in terms of contraception, in terms of making sure I'm getting tested. Um, these are the things that mature people do when, when they know that they're sexually active, because not only are you at risk, but your partner is at risk as well. So it's better just to know, um, and that way you never have to be concerned with something like gonorrhea or syphilis. Yes. Mm -hmm. If it's extremely concentrated, so if it is, um, let's say, you know, if it's 50% hydrogen peroxide and 50% water, that probably should not come in contact with your skin because it's too strong. Most hydrogen peroxide that you can buy from CVS is 5% hydrogen peroxide, 95% water. And that's that's an okay dilution. That's, that's not too strong for your skin. That has cleansing properties. Would you say?
same thing. Um, and there are also different types of, of alcohol. So, um, you know, ethanol is the alcohol that you drink. That's most of that is not very strong. Um, ethanol is, you might hear someone say, I'm drinking something that's 80 proof. That means that it's 40% alcohol. The rest of it is water or 20 proof, 10% alcohol. The rest of it is water. Um, isopropyl alcohol is typically the alcohol that we use for medical purposes. And it's also going to be pretty concentrated. Now, if you've ever lit a fire using alcohol, um, or if you've ever used like an a source of ignition that is specifically alcohol based, that's going to be much more concentrated, like 80%. And again, that should not come in contact with your skin. That's, that's not good for you. But the stuff that we're, you know, that we use medically is much more diluted and it's, it's not strong enough to hurt you really. Isopropyl alcohol, you should not drink. It's not good enough. You know, it's not good for your um, esophagus, but uh, it's good for your skin. It's okay. And for open wounds, it has cleansing properties. Good questions. Flammable? Because it has, because it has alcohol, right? Let's see. Yeah, so um, hand sanitizer is 75% alcohol. Interesting. What, did, what was your question, Paris? That's a, okay, that's a good question. That's, um, that's a chemical question, a chemistry question. So alcohol is literally anything that has, if you look at the periodic table, element number six is oxygen. Element number one is hydrogen. Those two elements like each other a lot. That's why they can bond together and create water, H2O. That's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. When there's only one hydrogen atom and one oxygen atom, that's just OH, it's called hydroxide. Anything that has hydroxide bound to it is going to be considered an alcohol. So there are different types of alcohol. Um, there's methyl alcohol, which is uh, three hydrogens, one carbon, and then that OH. Then there's um, ethanol, which is what we drink in our alcoholic beverages. That's two carbons, five hydrogens, and then OH. Um, so anything that has OH added to it is going to be considered an alcohol. That's that's some that's chemistry though. Good questions. Good question. Keep them coming. All right. Viruses. So the difference between a virus and bacteria or a bacterium is that viruses are non-living. What'd you say? Breathe. Made. That's a, okay. That's like an AP level question, but it's a good question. Let me see if I can. Correct. Correct. So, um, Viruses are thought to have been kind of the earliest, not even a life form, but the earliest precursor to life on the planet. Because basically a virus is just a protein package that has RNA on the inside. It has a little bit of nucleic acid on the inside. Um, not even DNA, just RNA. So it's very, it's simple stuff. Um, the way what Lance just said is, is exactly right. Viruses attach themselves to a living cell, and they inject that RNA. That RNA is a genetic code. And so that genetic code gets taken up by the host cell that is now being invaded. And that genetic code is then kind of incorporated into the cell's genetic code. And so the cell gets hijacked. And instead of doing whatever it's supposed to do, now its only job is to make more virus. So for example, um, if it's a white blood cell, the white blood cell's job is to basically serve as a defender, a protector against pathogens. If it gets invaded, the virus is going to send its RNA into the cell and the white blood cell now totally forgets what it was supposed to be doing. All it does is produce more virus. Um, of course, that's very, very dangerous. Um, these viruses are thought to have come about from the very earliest moments that, that life was beginning to form on the planet Earth, because 
Um, like I said, all they are is just a protein package and a little bit of genetic material on the inside. And so the thought is that when those proteins formed, the genetic material on the inside came about just by nature of what we talked about earlier in the unit or in the course. Monomers create polymers. So monomers of nucleotides literally just bonded together to create this polymer called RNA that we now call RNA. And you had your first virus. It wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It was just the beginning of, of life. So again, viruses are not living, but they are kind of that precursor to life. They have genetic material, um, but they don't have the other components that you would need to do things like cellular respiration or like protein synthesis. They, they, they can't do that. So that's the long story short answer. Would you say? There are bad viruses, yeah. Yeah, same thing, yeah. Just like we were just talking about the bacteria, some of them are good, some of them are harmless, they don't do anything really, and some of them are bad. Same thing with viruses. Um, we just don't talk about the ones that are, that are harmless. And by nature of natural selection, we'll talk about this as well, viruses actually have an incentive to not be that bad. Because if, they're if it's a really, really bad virus, like Ebola, for example, um, Ebola will kill the host within a few days. That doesn't really benefit the virus because now it doesn't have any living cells that it can hijack to, to reproduce. So the best viruses are viruses that you wouldn't even know that you have because they don't even want you to be sick. When you're sick, you stay home. You don't, you don't go out to spread the virus. The best viruses want you to come in contact with as many people as possible so that they can spread and continue to reproduce. Does that make sense? Same thing, We've even, even in the last year, which I'm about to talk about the coronavirus, but even in the last year, we've seen that people get have gotten less sick from the coronavirus because it's evolved. Again, when you're, when you're really sick, you're more likely to have a fatal event, which means that the virus won't have any living cells to help it reproduce. So you want to have a, maybe a mild sickness where you cough, and which spreads, you know, it spreads the virus a little bit, but it doesn't kill you. It, it wants, the virus wants to spread, but it, it wants to still be able to reproduce. So we've seen people get less sick over the last year. Of course, our treatments have gotten better too. Yeah, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Yes, which is yeah, that was the very beginning of vaccination. That was the first case of vaccination. Did I talk to, about this in this class? Or is this something you read about? Okay, so um, we'll talk more about vaccines on Monday, but the history of vaccines is really, really interesting. Of course, when Europeans first came to the Americas, we know they brought a lot of diseases with them, the most deadly of which was smallpox. Smallpox to this day remains the only virus that has been totally eradicated. Now, you have to put an asterisk on that because there are unfortunately some people um, in India and in some African countries who are still suffering from smallpox. But for the most part, smallpox was a pandemic that was wiping out Europe and Africa and Asia and the Americas for hundreds of years, and now we hardly even think about it. We haven't seen a case here in the United States since 1989 or 1992, something like that. Um, and the reason, so when the Europeans first came to the, to the Americas, they brought smallpox with them. It's estimated that about 95% of the indigenous population died because of some, some by direct massacres, but most of them died because of smallpox. Um, as a result, the Europeans are like, we're losing all of our labor. Of course, they had enslaved the indigenous people here in the Americas, and they were using them to, um, to provide labor. So they, they were freaking out at this point. So they start thinking about all these different ways to stop the spread of smallpox. What they found was that in some indigenous populations, some tribes, and even in some African tribes, um, what, they, what they later learned from African slaves, 
was if you take a little bit of the pus from somebody who has smallpox, literally smallpox causes all these open wounds in a person's skin. So if you take a little bit of the pus from that wound and you inject it into a healthy person, that person might have a mild sickness for a couple days, but then they, they're immune to smallpox. They never actually get the actual disease. Um, and, you know, of course, they went through trial and error in the beginning when they first started doing this. You know, it, it was like only 90 percent successful as they got better and they figured out exactly the right amount of um, disease to introduce to each person. The, the success rate, you know, rose and now, you know, 99 percent. So the word what's the word for cow in Spanish? Does anybody know? Baca. Yeah. That's where we get the word vaccination from, because it came from mad cow's disease. You're right. So um, it's an interesting history. So, yeah, I'll talk more about that on Monday. Somebody sent a message to the chat. Thank you, Josue Paco. Yeah, that's where the word vac vaccine comes from. <clears throat> okay, so this is an image of viruses at work literally just proteins, but they have this RNA inside and they inject the cell with the RNA. We've talked about transcription. Abina and I were just talking about transcription. What is, what is transcription? Who remembers? Abina, don't say it. When DNA goes to RNA. So there's actually a process called reverse transcription in which the RNA that a virus introduced is then used to create new DNA. It gets incorporated into the DNA of the cell. So we're going from RNA to DNA, it's reverse transcription. Now, um, of course, in the 21st century, we've been able to use that to our advantage. This is a, a really unique process. We can introduce um, specific vaccines in this way. And this is how the coronavirus vaccine works. You introduce small parts of the, the virus's RNA, not the entire thing, not enough to cause a sickness, but you introduce small parts of it. And the virus, you know, it works in the same way. You introduce a little bit of RNA, it gets into your cells, and then your cells start to produce the antibodies um, that prevent you from getting sick from coronavirus. So it's, it's pretty remarkable stuff. All right. Like a, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know much about why they have those those leg like structures. I, I, they're probably just proteins that are um, that have mobile ability, kind of like uh, we talked about the centrioles in this class that pull the, the chromosomes apart during mitosis. Same way, they, they function with the same kind of motor ability. I, that's a good question. I don't, and it looks like this. This might be a dramatization, but if you look in this, what looks like a um, electron microscope of imaging, I don't see spikes, but I, I do see this leg. Yeah, this legs, legs looking thing. Legs make sense. Like they need to, they need some force. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know. Good, that's a good question. Okay, so here are some examples of of common viruses. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of them. Unfortunately. Uh, what's the other one? HPV, HIV, herpes. There are four H's, four H STDs that are viruses that we have no cure for. So herpes, HIV, HPV, and hepatitis is the fourth one. I didn't put it on this slide. All four of them can be sexually transmitted, and we unfortunately don't have cures for any of them. So, uh, and there are different types of herpes too. So some herpes, you know will cause uh, cold sores, um, and, but they're not, they're not as severe, and they have nothing to do with a person's genitals. Um, but then, of course, HIV is something that has been raging at epidemic proportions for the last 40 years. We don't hear much about it here in the United States. You could probably make a social commentary about the reasons why that is. But of course, in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, HIV is still raging at, you know, basically uncontrolled rates. HIV itself um, does not guarantee that a person will have AIDS. In fact, if you know the basketball player, Magic Johnson, he's had HIV since 1991, 
um, at least. And so it's been 30 years and he, he has never developed AIDS. That's because he's been placed on what's called the cocktail, which means that he's been taking, you know, probably five to 10 pills every day for the last 30 years to prevent the HIV from um, developing into, into AIDS. Uh, so we still don't have cures, but we do have treatments. Unfortunately, those treatments are pretty expensive. Um, we have treatments that can actually get a person to the point where the HIV is no longer detectable in their blood. Um, so you won't, even if you take a blood sample from Magic Johnson, uh, you won't be able to see any of the human immunodeficiency virus in his blood because this cocktail has, has, has basically done its job for him. Uh, to about two years ago, a man in France was actually cured of HIV, meaning not just undetectable levels, but he has no HIV left in his body. Um, but it's only been done like twice in all of scientific history. And of course, millions of people have died from HIV. So we still don't have a cure. We still don't know exactly what happened with that man. We do know that he had previously had, um, he had previously undergone treatments for a specific type of cancer. I can't remember what it was. So the hypothesis is that his cancer treatments provided him some additional immune booster that made it possible for him to, to beat HIV. So still a lot of research into how, you know, into what the cure could eventually be for that, but we're not, we're not quite there yet. Can you pass it to your kids? Yes. You Yes. Yeah, so a mother, not a mother can pass HIV to her child. Now it's not genetic, but because during the process of gestation, you know, when a, when a baby is developing inside of its mother, um, the umbilical cord is delivering the mother's blood to the baby. That's the, that's the baby's source of oxygen. And in that blood, unfortunately, sometimes there can be, you know, HIV as well. It's not a guarantee, but it is, I, I do think it's more than more than fifty percent likely. Correct. So, yeah, Lance brings up a good point. When when women are addicted to a substance, they have some type of chemical dependency. Um, the baby will oftentimes come out with that same chemical dependency and have to go through a period of withdrawal um, in their first few days of of life. So uh, it's, it's a beautiful process because, of course, the mother is literally providing everything the baby needs. The baby doesn't have its own exposure to air, doesn't have its own exposure to food. It's getting everything it needs from the mother. Um, of course, if the mother is taking in substances that are uh, unnatural or, or unhealthy, then the baby will be exposed to that as well. All right, so just a little bit of talk about the coronavirus. We've talked about it before. Um, the coronavirus that we know today as the novel coronavirus is just one strain of a class of viruses. Most of the coronaviruses don't cause any severe sickness. In fact, almost every, probably everybody in this room has had at least one coronavirus in their life, and it just caused a common cold. Um, when we're kids, we get sick one to two times a year, maybe sometimes more. Um, but your body learns to build up defenses against those sicknesses so, such that by the time you turn 20, you're, you're getting sick less often, especially if you're, expo if you're not you know, in new areas. Um, but this new novel coronavirus does have some specific and unique qualities that have made it much, easily, much more easily spread. Uh, it has a scientific name that is SARS-CoV-2, which stands for SARS is uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome. Then COVID is, of course, coronavirus. And this is really the second one. So SARS-CoV-1 also caused a pretty severe epidemic. It didn't reach pandemic proportions, but uh, between 2002 and 2004, in, um, primarily in China, there was a SARS outbreak, which did kill a lot of people. But it, like I said, it didn't reach pandemic proportions. Uh, the word corona, means crown. And so the crown of this coronavirus really refers to the spikes that are on the outside of the virus. And the spikes, if you guys ever seen those, um, I don't even know, they're like from, from a plant. It's that really spiky ball that if you come, 
yeah, it gets stuck. It gets stuck to your clothes, and it, if you touch it, it's actually kind of painful. The spikes of the coronavirus work the same way. They're there to help it stick to your cells. That way, they can infect them with their. Uh, it should say viral RNA, not DNA. So, what does it actually do to your body? So, we're still learning about all the things that this virus, all the damage that it can cause inside of the human body. Um, we do at this point. We have basically, um, we're pretty sure that it came from, it has zoo, what is it called? Zoogenetic origins, meaning it came from an animal. We're pretty sure it came from a bat, um, but we're still learning what it actually does to humans. We know at this point it's more than just a respiratory disease, but that is the primary um, damage that it does is to your lungs. There are specific cells inside of your lungs called alveoli and those alveoli are the site of gas exchange in our bodies. So, of course, we need to take in oxygen, and that oxygen then gets delivered via our blood to the rest of our bodies. But we also need to get rid of carbon dioxide. Um, and these alveoli are where that exchange is supposed to happen. The coronavirus will invade those alveoli um, and again, hijack them so that they stop doing what they're supposed to do and their sole job becomes producing more virus. So this is what leads to people having diminishing oxygen uptake. Um, and when your body is not taking in oxygen, a lot of bad things start to happen. Including, eventually it can lead to pretty severe blood clots. Now, if you have a blood clot, uh, medically we call it an embolus. Uh, if you have a blood clot in your leg, it might be a little painful. You might feel some tightness in your leg, but it's, it's not deadly. The problem is when that blood clot becomes dislodged and it travels to more important parts of your body, like your lungs, the muscles that surround your heart and your brain. If the blood clot travels to your lungs, um, you can eventually have what's called a hematoma, which is, a, which is basically a, a blood bruise in your lung. Uh, your lungs start to fill up with actual blood and fluid, and that can be fatal. If the blood clot travels to your the muscles that surround your heart, what do you think happens? Anybody? You get a heart attack. Yeah, that's what we call a myocardial infarction. That means that the muscles that surround your heart um, stop functioning properly, and it can actually seize, and that's what a heart attack is. Um, and if it travels to your brain, what do you think happens in that case? You can have an aneurysm. Um, which could otherwise is known as a stroke, basically. Um, so not good. Blood, blood clots are not meant to travel. Um, some people have naturally clotting blood and they have to take blood thinners to prevent this from happening. But coronavirus can accelerate this process. Yeah, so our, we all have to, um, we need our blood to clot, right? That when we have, when we have sores or open wounds, our blood is supposed to, we, we have platelets and we have what are called um, thrombocytes in our blood that are supposed to travel to the site of a wound and they block the wound so that you stop bleeding. And that's, that's healthy, but some people unfortunately do that too much. Some people on the other hand are anemic and they don't have the ability to do that, which is also dangerous. So um, again, and that's, that's kind of the general theme with human anatomy. Too much is not good. Too little is not good. You gotta have a balance. Homeostasis. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, they also have blood clotting venom as well, which is also, again, not good. So uh, people who have had coronavirus, some of them will lose their senses of smell and taste. Um, that we're still learning about, we think it's because of the impact that the, the virus has on your nerve endings, um, specifically the nerve endings that are in your sinus cavities. Uh, of course, if you can't smell, you can't taste. So it's not your taste buds that are being damaged, it's just the fact that you, uh, your, your olfactory senses, your ability to smell have been damaged. And then also your digestive system can be impacted by this virus as well. In fact, some of the late stages of a fatal coronavirus case, we start to see kidney failure. We see some uh, people who have diarrhea as well. When the virus was first um, kind of exploding in Wuhan, China, people were staying inside of their apartments and somehow still getting the coronavirus. What they found out was that 
um, some of the sicker people in the building who were basically on the verge of dying had bad cases of diarrhea and the virus was actually traveling through the sewage systems um, from one apartment to the next. So again, in the, in the earliest stages of the coronavirus, it was really, really good at causing very severe sicknesses. Now it's a lot better at being spread, but it doesn't cause many severe sicknesses. And we'll talk about that. That's natural selection at work. All right, so a couple more pathogens. Toxins, I'm gonna play the video while you guys wait, so that way we don't run out of time. But a toxin is a poison or a venom. And apparently there's a difference between the two, who knew? Would you rather be bitten by a venomous snake or touch a poisonous frog? Wait, what's the difference between poison and venom anyway? Let's say you have the misfortune to be bitten by a venomous rattlesnake. When it bites you, the snake will eject venom from little sacs behind its eyes, through its hollow fangs, and into your flesh. That venom will then travel through your bloodstream all over your body. In most cases, snake venom contains neurotoxins, proteins that can do all sorts of nasty stuff like make your muscles fire uncontrollably, burst your blood cells, and make you go completely numb. But you might get lucky. Snakes don't always decide you're worth wasting venom on. In fact, between 20 and 80% of snake bites are so-called dry bites, where the snake is just trying to send a message without actually killing you. You see, venom takes energy and resources for the snake to make, and they don't want to waste it on a warning shot. When it comes to poison, on the other hand, there's no warning shot. If you pick up a poisonous dart frog to admire its beautiful colors, you've already gotten deadly poison all over your hands. As it seeps into your skin and travels through your blood, the poison starts to interfere with your nerves, preventing your muscles from contracting. If the frog's poison reaches your heart, it can cause it to stop. The distinction between venom and poison is purely in the method of delivery. Poison has to be inhaled, ingested, or absorbed, and venom has to be injected into a wound. Chemically, venoms and poisons are both considered toxins. So a snake bite is venomous. A poison dart frog is poisonous. Brown recluse spiders are venomous, hoverfish are poisonous. And some compounds can be poisons in one animal and venoms in another. Tetrodotoxin, a chemical 10,000 times more toxic than cyanide, is found in pufferfish, where it makes them poisonous. It's also found in the deadly blue-ringed octopus, where it's a venom delivered by bite. Some animals can even be both poisonous and venomous. Take the Asian tiger snake, for example. Not only does it have venom in its fangs, but it also absorbs the toxins from the poisonous toads it eats, and then secretes those toxins from special glands on its neck, rendering it poisonous, too. Scientists are constantly finding new animals that employ toxins in weird, interesting ways. Recently, researchers discovered the very first venomous crustacean. Out of 70,000 species of crustaceans, only this one little remipede is venomous. Speleonectes tulumensis has figured out how to create a cocktail of toxins that it delivers through its tiny fangs. Scientists aren't totally sure how this venom works yet, but they think that it causes the unwitting victim's neurons to fire over and over and over again until it becomes paralyzed. Then the little remipede closes in, dissolving away the exoskeleton of its prey and sucking out the juices. But poisons and venoms aren't always all bad. For thousands of years, humans have looked for ways to harness the power of these toxic compounds for good. Today, we have all sorts of medicines that come from toxins. The poison from cone snails is used as a painkiller. Many poisonous plants have been used to treat everything from malaria to irregular heartbeats. And scorpion venom might one day be used to treat heart disease. So what should you do if something bites or poisons you? Don't try any of the things you've seen on the internet or in movies. Don't try to capture and kill the animal that bit you, and don't use a tourniquet or knife on your wound. Most importantly, don't panic. Stay calm and seek medical attention. Treatment will mostly depend on what species you encountered. But if you forget the distinction between poison and venom and tell the paramedics that you were poisoned by a viper, they'll probably forgive you and treat you anyway. Okay, last type of pathogen is a parasite. Parasites 
are organisms that live in or on a host and that get their food from and sometimes at the expense of the host. Uh, of course, some are worse than others. Some parasites literally just use their host to kind of find other sources of food. Some parasites take the food from the host. Um, literally, there are parasites that live inside. Yeah, there are some parasites that can live inside of the human digestive system and people feel like they're eating, but they're rapidly losing weight. That's because the parasite is actually taking all the nutrients from the food and the water as well. So quite dangerous. Again, I'm going to play the video while you guys write. Which of these entities has evolved the ability to manipulate an animal many times its size? The answer is all of them. These are all parasites, organisms that live on or inside another host organism, which they harm and sometimes even kill. Parasite survival depends on transmitting from one host to the next, sometimes through an intermediate species. Our parasites elegantly achieve this by manipulating their host's behavior, sometimes through direct brain hijacking. For example, this is the Gordian worm. One of its hosts, this cricket. The Gordian worm needs water to mate, but the cricket prefers dry land. So once it's big enough to reproduce, the worm produces proteins that garble the cricket's navigational system. The confused cricket jumps around erratically, moves closer to water, and eventually leaps in, often drowning in the process. The worm then wriggles out to mate, and its eggs get eaten by little water insects that mature, colonize land, and are in turn eaten by new crickets. And thus, the Gordian worm lives on. And here's the rabies virus, another mind-altering parasite. This virus infects mammals, often dogs, and travels up the animal's nerves to its brain where it causes inflammation that eventually kills the host. But before it does, it often increases its host's aggressiveness and ramps up the production of rabies-transmitting saliva while making it hard to swallow. These factors make the host more likely to bite another animal and more likely to pass the virus on when it does. And now meet Ophiocordyceps, also known as the zombie fungus. Its host of choice is tropical ants that normally live in treetops. After Ophiocordyceps spores pierce the ant's exoskeleton, they set off convulsions that make the ant fall from the tree. The fungus changes the ant's behavior, compelling it to wander mindlessly until it stumbles onto a plant leaf with the perfect fungal breeding conditions, which it latches onto. The ant then dies, and the fungus parasitizes its body to build a tall, thin stalk from its neck. Within several weeks, the stalk shoots off spores, which turn more ants into six-legged, leaf-seeking zombies. One of humanity's most deadly assailants is a behavior-altering parasite, though if it's any consolation, it's not our brains that are being hijacked. I'm talking about plasmodium which causes malaria. This parasite needs mosquitoes to shuttle it between hosts, so it makes them bite more frequently and for longer. There's also evidence that humans infected with malaria are more attractive to mosquitoes, which will bite them and transfer the parasite further. This multi-species system is so effective that there are hundreds of millions of malaria cases every year. And finally, there are cats. Don't worry, there probably aren't any cats living in your body and controlling your thoughts. I mean, probably. But there is a microorganism called toxoplasma that needs both cats and rodents to complete its life cycle. When a rat gets infected by eating cat feces, the parasite changes chemical levels in the rat's brain, making it less cautious around the hungry felines, maybe even attracted to them. This makes them easy prey so these infected rodents get eaten and pass the parasite on. Mind control successful. There's even evidence that the parasite affects human behavior. In most cases, we don't completely understand how these parasites manage their feats of behavior modification. 
but from what we do know, we can tell that they have a pretty diverse toolbox. Gordian worms seem to affect crickets' brains directly. The malaria parasite, on the other hand, blocks an enzyme that helps the mosquitoes feed, forcing them to bite over and over and over again. The rabies virus may cause that snarling, slobbering behavior by putting the immune system into overdrive. But whatever the method, when you think about how effectively these parasites control the behavior of their hosts, you may wonder, how much of human behavior is actually parasites doing the talking? Since more than half of the species on Earth are parasites, it could be more than we think. Last, last stuff, you don't, go ahead, yeah. We don't really need to write down everything here. We'll talk a little bit more about this on Monday when we mention antibiotics, antivirals, and vaccines. Um, but natural selection is, of course, playing a role um, in not only the parasites, but in all of the pathogens that we talked about today. Um, bacteria and viruses evolve very quickly um, they, because they reproduce very, very quickly. You know, they undergo mitosis which means that they just make copies of themselves. But as they make copies of themselves, mutations are bound to happen. Some mutations make the viruses and the bacteria more likely to spread. Some of them make them more dangerous, meaning they lead to more severe sicknesses. But as I mentioned earlier, it actually benefits the virus to be less dangerous and more easily spreadable. Um, so natural selection typically chooses the organisms that are going to be able to spread more because that means they'll survive and they'll reproduce more. Uh, that means that our natural and artificial defenses have to evolve as well, meaning our immune systems have to get better and our medicines have to get better in order to meet the challenges of these evolving viruses and bacteria. Um, it's kind of, I think about it in terms of the Cold War. Do you guys know what the Cold War? It, was okay so the cold war was a period of escalation between the between the soviet union and the united states um, the soviet union was developing these nuclear powers these nuclear weapons and so the united states had to develop uh, equally strong defenses uh, against those weapons and so then so the soviet union made even stronger weapons and the united states had equally strong defenses and and stronger weapons as well well. So we just keep seeing this, this arms race taking place between the two countries as they basically try to outdo one another. Um, the same thing happens in nature. We can think about the example of lions and gazelles in the Sahara, or not the Sahara, in the safari. Um, as the lions get faster, they start to catch up to more gazelles, which means that only the very fastest gazelles survive. Um, and that means those fast gazelles mate and they have even faster gazelle offspring, which means that those gazelles are gonna outrun the lions. So the, the slowest lions die because they can't get any food. So that means only the fastest lions survive and they have faster lion offspring. And so you see this, this escalation of both parties getting faster and faster and faster. Same thing happens with these bacteria and viruses. As they get stronger, as they spread more easily, we have to create um, medicines that are even stronger. And unfortunately, nature is probably gonna win out. So let's take a look at this one last video. What if I told you there were trillions of tiny bacteria all around you? It's true. Microorganisms called bacteria were some of the first life forms to appear on Earth. Though they consist of only a single cell, their total biomass is greater than that of all plants and animals combined. And they live virtually everywhere, on the ground, in the water, on your kitchen table, on your skin, even inside you. Don't reach for the panic button just yet. Although you have 10 times more bacterial cells inside you than your body has human cells, many of these bacteria are harmless or even beneficial, helping digestion and immunity. But there are a few bad apples that can cause harmful infections, from minor inconveniences to deadly epidemics. 
Fortunately, there are amazing medicines designed to fight bacterial infections. Synthesized from chemicals or occurring naturally in things like mold, these antibiotics kill or neutralize bacteria by interrupting cell wall synthesis <clears throat> or interfering with vital processes like protein synthesis, all while leaving human cells unharmed. The deployment of antibiotics over the course of the 20th century has rendered many previously dangerous diseases easily treatable. But today, more and more of our antibiotics are becoming less effective. Did something go wrong to make them stop working? The problem is not with the antibiotics, but the bacteria they were made to fight. And the reason lies in Darwin's theory of natural selection. Just like any other organisms, individual bacteria can undergo random mutations. Many of these mutations are harmful or useless, but every now and then, one comes along that gives its organism an edge in survival. And for a bacterium, a mutation making it resistant to a certain antibiotic gives quite the edge. As the non-resistant bacteria are killed off, which happens especially quickly in antibiotic-rich environments like hospitals, there is more room and resources for the resistant ones to thrive, passing along only the mutated genes that help them do so. Reproduction isn't the only way to do this. Some can release their DNA upon death to be picked up by other bacteria, while others use a method called conjugation, connecting through pili to share their genes. Over time, the resistant genes proliferate, creating entire strains of resistant superbacteria. So how much time do we have before these superbugs take over? Well, in some bacteria, it's already happened. For instance, some strands of Staphylococcus aureus, which causes everything from skin infections to pneumonia and sepsis, have developed into MRSA, becoming resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics like penicillin, methicillin, and oxacillin. Thanks to a gene that replaces the protein beta-lactams normally target and bind to, MRSA can keep making its cell walls unimpeded. Other superbacteria, like Salmonella, even sometimes produce enzymes like beta-lactamase, that break down antibiotic attackers before they can do any damage. And E. coli, a diverse group of bacteria that contains strains that cause diarrhea and kidney failure, can prevent the function of antibiotics like quinolones by actively booting any invaders that manage to enter the cell. But there is good news. Scientists are working to stay one step ahead of the bacteria. And although development of new antibiotics has slowed in recent years, the World Health Organization has made it a priority to develop novel treatments. Other scientists are investigating alternate solutions, such as phage therapy or using vaccines to prevent infections. Most importantly, curbing the excessive and unnecessary use of antibiotics, such as for minor infections that can resolve on their own, as well as changing medical practice to prevent hospital infections, can have a major impact by keeping more non-resistant bacteria alive as competition for resistant strains. In the war against superbacteria, de-escalation may sometimes work better than an evolutionary arms race. All right, well, we have two minutes left. So keep in mind, Tuesday, April 20th, that's when we will take our unit exam. That's also the assignments will be due. So if you need to take 30 minutes of your weekend to do that, I encourage you to do so. But I know uh, we're all in need of some well-deserved relaxation. So make sure you take care of yourselves this weekend. Two minutes, two minutes.
see you all. Have a good weekend. I'll talk to you on Monday. Gracias.